Hi guys. guys! Welcome back. Now we're going to take a look at more chemical properties of our transition metals. The next of which is going to be the fact that the transition metals or their compounds, they are going to be very good catalysts. Mm -hmm. So run me through Mr. Tim, what is a catalyst? Yeah, sure. So a catalyst, right, is a substance that increases the rate of reaction, mm -hmm. okay, by providing an alternative reaction pathway with an EA that is lowered, right, but it remains chemically unchanged. Okay. There are two different types of catalysts yeah. uh, we're going to learn, heterogeneous as well as homogeneous. Mm -hmm. What's yeah. the difference between them? Well, hetero means different, homo means same. So mm -hmm. heterogeneous means that the reagents, other reactants and the catalyst, they're in different phase. And then for homo, they're in the same phase. Okay. Right? What's the difference between the word phase and state? Oh, we've got to be I careful use them here. Yeah, interchangeably. Got to be very, very careful. So this is oil and this is water. You, of course, you would see that now, Mr. Leong, they're both in liquid state, right? That's right. But they're in different phases because oh. they do not mix, right? Okay. So, so we would say, yeah, uh, They're what we call immiscible, right? Yeah, immiscible mm -hmm. liquid, so they're different phase. But, Mr. Leong, if I have in different states, so let's say a solid rock and water, mm. if the states are different, does that mean that a phase is confirmed different? Uh, likely, right? They don't dissolve again. Yes. Now, so the first one we're going to be talking about, talking about here is the heterogeneous catalyst and I'll just zoom in into one example here mm -hmm. which is the hydrogenation of alkenes okay mm -hmm. now you're going to use a nickel catalyst and notice how the nickel is clearly in a solid state mm -hmm. right and your reagents here are in liquid state and gaseous state and what we just said just now right if the states are different the phases are confirmed different right mm -hmm. so this is a clearly a hetero catalyst okay now we are going to remind you a little bit of what you have learned in reaction kinetics and remind you that Heterocatalysis, right? It is based on the adsor adsorption theory, not ad not adsorb, adsorb. Okay, with the, the D. D, right? So you're gonna outline the mechanism for me. Uh, of course, as usual. Okay, I know you hate this. <laughs> I will do this. Okay, so you have this bit, right, of nickel catalyst, right, and your reactant particles will come in and diffuse onto it. So of course, when you diffuse, right, Mr. Leong. So when you sit onto it, do you form bonds or do you break bonds? Uh, I like to sit onto the thing, so I need to uh, form bonds Clearly. With, the, with the metal, right? Clearly. So again, right, Mr. Long, and remind me, when we form bonds, right, is energy released or is energy taken in? Form bonds is going to release energy. Yes. So when you form these bonds, it will release energy. Can you see how we just broke off this pi bond here? Okay. It's broken off, okay? Same thing. Break off this sigma bond, it is slowly breaking off, okay? So now, this idea is called adsorption, and highlight with me, so when your reactant molecules sit onto it, it increases the concentration of the reactants on the surface. Like we said, it weakens the covalent bonds, okay? And the next part is quite beautiful, Mr. Leong, because now your reactant particles are just next to each other. Mm -hmm. So it is so easy to form bonds, mm -hmm. right? So you can see here, the moment they're just beside each other, they can just start forming bonds with each other, okay? Mm -hmm. And again, because they are so close, it is easier to form bonds. Your EA is now lower. Remember your definition that we saw just now? Perfect, okay? Yes, so again, close proximity, perfect orientation for reaction. Now, all you have to do is just to react. And again, Mr. Leong, when I form this bond, bonds mass. When bonds I form bonds, you form, you are actually releasing energy again. Yes, okay? So when I form this bond, I release energy, break this bond, break mm -hmm. this bond, everything goes off, okay? You can see here, I only have one bond left. Mm -hmm. And all we have left now is the product. We just have to be plucked off from the surface, so we desorb off. Okay, so we desorb. Goodbye, bond, and he he runs free. Okay, so there's a small little thing that we have to be careful here. That remember the bonds that you form at the beginning, they must be very very weak. Okay, yes. So the bonds must be weak because if the bonds are too strong, then notice how your product it is not able to desorb from the surface. That's very important. Okay. So this is something you sell in kinetics, but mm. um, in the context of transition metals, yes. can you tell me what is a very distinctive feature about a transition metal that allows it to be uh, acting as a heterogeneous catal a catalyst? For sure. So go back to the first part of absorption. Mm. For you to form bonds with the catalyst, then you need to have orbitals. So if you're looking at transition metals, these orbitals are your 3D. You need to have empty 3D orbitals. So you get, if you go down with me, let's unline together. You need partially filled, okay, all empty. 3D orbitals that are low in energy, right? Low lying, low in energy to accept electrons from the reactant molecules to be adsorbed onto it. Okay? So this is the key principle as to why uh, transition metals or their compounds, ions, uh, are able to become a, a heterogeneous catalyst.
Okay, the next kind of catalysis is the homogeneous one where mm -hmm. Mr. Tim uh, spoke about this before that uh, you're going to see the catalyst being in the same phase as the reactants. The classic example over here is the reaction between peroxyl disulfate and the iodide ions. Now, these two ions are all in an aqueous phase and turns out the catalyst we're going to use is Fe2+, which mm -hmm. also is in an aqueous phase. Okay, now if I take a look at the uncatalyzed version, right, uh, we are going to calculate the E cell value uh, because this is a redox reaction, we're going to see how feasible it is. Now, I don't think it's too hard for you to realize that after the calculation, this value will be positive. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean, Mr. Tim? Well, if it's positive E cell, that means a delta G is less than zero spontaneous reaction. That's right. So this is talking about energetic feasibility, mm -hmm. right? But we fail to consider the kinetic feasibility. Uh, turns out the reaction is actually very slow. So can you tell me why this reaction is very slow? Well, I can see that you're trying to react a negatively charged species with yet another negatively charged species. They will clearly electrostatically repel. <laughs> Okay. okay, so this is going to translate to high activation energy and we all know from kinetics that that will translate towards a low reaction rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you say we want to overcome this problem. What do we do? We introduce a positively charged catalyst. Yeah. Our uh, main character here is Fe2+, mm. right? So we are going to take a look at the mechanism of it. Sure. So this is going to be a two-step mechanism. Now the Fe2 plus will first react with the peroxyl disulfate. Okay, now this is good because you notice that this is going to be oppositely charged <laughs> ions reacting together. So mm -hmm. obviously this is going to lower my activation energy, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to see how this is being uh, rep uh, shown inside the energy profile diagram later on. Okay, so one of the things that you are required to do is to go and calculate the E cell for the first step. Okay, so that's what you're going to see at the bottom. You will also notice that it is going to be a positive value. Now, following which your Fe2 plus uh, is going to temporarily change into Fe3 plus. We call this the intermediate. Mm -hmm. Now, this Fe3 plus will now be responsible for reacting with the other reactant, which is my iodide. And of course, this is another redox reaction that requires us to calculate the E cell value. So if you do all your simple calculations, you will notice that step two also has a positive E cell. Okay, so very good. Two steps, all both positive E cell, and they are all reacting with oppositely charged ions that totally uh, bypass my problem, overcomes my problem Fantastic. altogether. Fantastic. So that's how it works, right? Very nice. Now, mm. um, let's take a look at the energy profile diagram. So let's go down to the bottom, next page. Mm -hmm. Now you notice that originally for the uncatalyzed version in a one step process, uh, you notice that the activation energy is very high. How about what happens if you add the catalyst, Mr. Tim? Well, then you're going to be lowering right, the activation energy, but not only that, right, you'll also be splitting it into two steps. Mm. Okay? And two steps means two humps. Let's go. Right. So therefore, you see that there is a lower activation energy for the second one as well. Mm -hmm. okay? So this is how you can represent uh, the fact that there is an alternative pathway when your catalyst is used. You do not directly react in one step. You go through a slight detour. Right, mm -hmm. and that is what it means by alternative pathway. Yes. Okay. Uh, one important thing for you to note is the fact that uh, for this particular reaction, uh, can you only use Fe two plus as a as a catalyst? Turns out it's not. In fact, you can also use Fe three plus as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. The only uh, catch is that step one and step two must be reversed. Now let's go one step further. Can I use other metals uh, or rather other metal ions? to uh, act as homogeneous catalysis, okay? So in this case, we have to understand what is the main principle behind homogeneous catalysis. Uh, you tell me that the homogeneous catalyst, right, must have the ability to exhibit variable oxidation states. Okay, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that it is easy to interconvert between these oxidation states. Mm. Now, here's the point. What, 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 what do you mean by ease of interconversion? So you say that you want the ion to be easily reduced and oxidized. So let's take a look at the E0 value, Mr. Tim. If you want somebody to be uh, easily reduced, right, mm -hmm. should the number be as high or as low as possible? Well, very high, right? Bigger mm. the E0, the more I reduce. More positive, right? Yeah, for and sure. And how about if I want it to be very easy to oxidize? Then the other way, very negative, very yes. small. Mm. So if you want to interconvert between them, it must mean that it is easy to convert, it is easy to get oxidized and reduced at the same time. You want to be very high and very low at the same time. Mm. So this must mean that the number mm. that you're going to look at must be a moderate number. Mm. So. After all this discussion, let's talk about the main point. We say that whenever, if you want to choose a catalyst to yeah. catalyze the, the, the reaction between peroxyl disulfate mm -hmm. as well as iodide, you have to choose a value that is in between that or uh, the, the E0 value of the reduced and the oxidized. So in this context, uh, your catalyst, right, the E0 value must be in between plus 0 .2, uh, 2 0.01 as well as 0 0.54. Mm. Now, if I take a look at the one for Fe2+, plus, uh, the value is plus 0 0.77, so that totally satisfies my criteria. Yes. How about the one for Cobalt 3+, plus to Cobalt 2+, plus, Mr. Tim? Well, it is plus 1.89, mm -hmm. and if my EMF serves me well, plus 1.89 is between 0.54 and 2.01. 
So it should work. That's right. Yeah. Uh, chromium 3 plus to chromium 2 plus? Uh, not quite, right? Because it's not in that range anymore. Okay. Right? Then can I just offer you one more? Can I do the one for chromium 3 plus to chromium? Oh, sorry. Chromium 3 plus to chromium, yes. Oh, this guy. Chromium mm. 3 plus to chromium. But, but but chromium is in solid state, Mr. Leong. What are you trying to say? It's oh. homogeneous catalyst, right? They must be in the same phase. So it cannot. Okay, yeah. so therefore, when you choose the E0 values, you have to be very cautious. Make sure that they are all in an aqueous phase. All right, hi guys. Okay, so the next chemical property we're going to be looking at is complex ions. I promise you, not so complex, quite simple, okay? <laughs> Funny joke, Mr. Tim. Okay, now, to first understand, we have to look at the definition of what a complex is, right? So it consists of a central metal atom or ion. So if you look at this diagram here, we have that central metal manganese 2 plus ion, okay? That is datively bonded, I'm going to highlight with you, datively bonded by one or more ligands, okay? Now, Mr. Long, what is ligands? So in this context, yeah. water is our ligand, oh. and by definition, we are actually saying that a ligand is a species which contains at least one lone pair of electrons. Okay. This lone pair of electrons is readily uh, available to donate it to the central metal atom uh, or an ion using a dative bond. Mm. So Mr. Tim, can you run us through why is it that transition metals are very popular, uh, very easily form those complexes? Well, of course, because first things first, right? To accept a lone pair of electron, then mm. number one, I obviously must have empty orbitals, okay? So vacant, d orbitals in this context. Now, of course, to accept electrons, my orbitals must be low in energy, and that's what low lying means, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the next part of a d block element that's quite interesting is this. Um, to form a complex ion, like we said just now, it must be a dative covalent bond. Now, why covalent? Now, here's the thing. Now, remember that d block elements, like what we mentioned in density, they have a very high charge density because they have high Q, large charge, mm -hmm. and because of the high charge density, they have a very high polarizing power. That means, if you remember from J1 bonding, I will be able to polarize the electron clouds, the anion electron cloud, resulting in the formation of covalent bond. Okay, so that's it. So let's take a little bit more uh, a closer look at ligands themselves. So sure. there are going to be different kinds of ligands. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on how many uh, lone pairs that the ligands have uh, to form dative bond with my central metal atom or ion. Right? Okay. So uh, if you only have one, we're going to call it a monodentate. Here are some of the classic examples you must know. Water, ammonia, chloride, uh, and cy cyanide ions. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is bidentate. Right? So bidentate simply means that you have two of them which must be fairly far apart so that they are able to form dative bonds with the central metal uh, atom or ion. Mm. The classic one is ethane 1,2-diamine uh, or uh, ethane dioate ion. Mm. Okay? Uh, the last one is quite special. It is actually forming up to six uh, uh, dative bonds Six. per mm. uh, ligand. That's called a hexadentate ligand. And uh, in this case, the classic one is going to be EDTA4 minus. So I hope you remember this name well. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Tim, all of them have the word dentate. Can yeah. you remind me again what, why, why is it called a dentate? Well, dentate reminds me of visiting a dentist. Oh, right? okay. Every time the dentist put his finger in my mouth, I will always bite. <laughs> <laughs> so, dentate just means bite. Monodentate okay. means I bite once, bidentate means I bite twice. Okay. You, you, they actually uh, translate to the fact that you're forming a dative bond, right? Exactly, so I bite into his finger. All right. Okay. Now, but before we move on, just one more small thing. Now remember, if it's a monodentate ligand, mm. right, then if I form four coordination, if I involve four ligands, four monodentate ligands, then my coordination number will be four. But if it's a bidentate ligand, now notice here that I will have, I'm using four ligands, but does that mean my coordination, sorry, excuse me, I have three ligands, but does that mean my coordination number is three, Mr. Leong? Uh, no. So oh. we need to know, look at the definition of a coordination number, right? right. So that simply refers to the number of dative yes. bonds uh, that you can find bonded towards the central metal atom or ion. Yes. So in this case, while there are only three ligands, mm -hmm. you actually notice that the coordination number is actually six. Okay. So to test you, uh, Mr. Tim, let's look at oh. a hexadentate one. Uh, if I take a look at the next one, mm. can you tell me what is the coordination yes. number for uh, the one on the right-hand side? Okay, I'm not going to look at the number of ligands. Yeah? I'm just going to look at the number of... Um, dative bonds. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 dative bonds, 6 coordination number. That's Easy. Right. That's right. So uh, even though there's only just one ligand, mm. you actually say a coordination number is actually 6. Yes. Okay. Uh, the other concept that's more important is also to recognize the uh, charge of the complex. Now this one, I don't think it's very hard. The idea is very similar to what you did for oxidation states. Mm. We're going to look at all the individual elements, uh, calculate their oxidation states. The sum of all these oxidation states will result in the overall charge. Right? Uh, this is a very simple idea, but I think yeah. questions can be quite tough. So we have seen how to do these questions inside uh, our lessons itself already. Mm -hmm. The last of which is we're going to pay attention to the shape of your complexes. Uh, 
So uh, turns out, if you have different coordination number, we are going to end up with different shapes. Yes. So uh, in general, I hope that you know that if you have two coordination number, uh, why is the shape, Mr. Tim? Well, it's like two bond pair, zero lone pair, kind of mm. like linear. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if it's four, then unfortunately, you're going to see uh, uh, two different options. Lah. Yeah. So if coordination number four, what are the different shapes is possible? Well, we have one like a square planar that you guys have learned, and the mm. other one is tetrahedral. Okay. Right. Uh, mm. uh, the last one will be very common. Okay, you're going to start to see a coordination number of six, uh, mm -hmm. what is this shape over here? Well, octahedral. That's right. So the good thing about this is that you don't really need to memorize who is going to undergo what kind of shape, yeah. right? Uh, especially for the one for four coordination number, you don't mm -hmm. really have to know. Uh, but in the event that you know that it's six coordination number, I expect you to know that it's octahedral. And when you draw out the structure, I expect you to illustrate that 3D configuration. For sure. That's it. That's it. Holy moly, that's it. That's a wrap. Bye. <laughs>